Just over two months ago, we reviewed the Creality Ender 3 V2, which after my positive experience for the past two years with the original, I was very excited for. Well, since that review, I've gotten a flood of requests of people asking me to review the Voxelab Aquila 3D printer. And looking at the specs, looking at the photos, it looks nearly identical to the Ender 3 V2. However, the key thing that so many people seem interested in was the price difference between the two. With the Ender 3 V2 being right now between $260 to $280 and the Aquila being between $170 to $180, it is substantially cheaper and puts it in the same price bracket as actually the original Ender 3. With the many viewer requests and the massive price difference between the two, I was definitely interested in seeing what this printer was all about. Voxelab did end up reaching out to me asking if I was interested in taking a look at this Aquila which I said yes, and I have been putting it through its paces. So in today's video, we will look at the Aquila's specs, which spoiler alert, are basically a one-to-one -to, -one to the Ender 3 V2, talk about the setup, my experience, of course, print quality, and then I will give you my final opinion on this 3D printer. This has got to be one of the most requested reviews that I've had in a very long time, so I hope that you guys are excited, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Massive thanks to Thanks for sponsoring today's video. With over 2 million index models in their database and growing regularly, Thanks finds the exact model that you're looking for. Thanks has some pretty unique features, like the ability to perform a geometric search or the recently added AR mode that I love. I'm a very visual person, and having the ability to place a 3D model in your space before actually printing it for reference can be quite useful. Also, it's a lot of fun and can make for some great photos. There are also great collaboration functionality baked right in, like the ability to create a private team for working on projects where you can keep track of things like different model versions as well as revisions. You also have the ability to follow a user's project, which is great for any that are actively being updated. Things has been developing new features for their site constantly, and I'm really looking forward to seeing this platform continue to expand. Links will be in the description so that you can find out more and check out things for yourself. For anyone that's not familiar with Voxelab, you are not alone, and I hadn't actually heard of them until the last few months here. Well, they did let me know in an email that they are actually a sub-brand of FlashForge, which makes a lot more sense because FlashForge has been around for a very long time, and I think that even in 2014 when I bought my first printer, they were making 3D printers at that point as well. So in a typical fashion to the 3D printer reviews we do on this channel, let's first run through this printer's specs. The Aquila, which I am tempted to call the Aquila, <laughs> but I don't think that's right, has a 220 by 220 by 250 millimeter build volume. It's made up of the traditional aluminum extrusions that we see on almost every printer nowadays. It is a 24 volt system running a 32 bit board with their flavor of Marlin and it has silent TMC2208 stepper drivers. The bed is made up of the glass ultra base style material and it does have manual bed leveling which will be done via the four large knobs. Similar also to the Ender 3 V2, there are two mounting holes on the hot end uh, assembly or the hot end housing, which looks like they are to be able to mount something like a BL Touch if you do want to add auto bed leveling. There's actually a pre-compiled firmware from Voxelab, which should make that a very easy upgrade should you want to do so. As far as the hot end goes, it is not all metal and it looks identical to the standard Creality hot end. Which, one thing that's awesome about that is that it looks like if you wanted to upgrade to something like the Micro Swiss All Metal Hot End that's a drop-in for the Creality printers, you might actually be able to just drop that into the Aquila as well. It uses a plastic Bowden style extruder and the Bowden tubing is a little bit more translucent than I'm used to seeing, which I do like as it makes it easier to see if there's some filament stuck, especially if it's like a clear or natural color. As far as connectivity goes, you can print via micro SD card over the screen or tethered with a micro USB cable. The screen on the Aquila is also the same format as the Ender 3 V2, but it's fitted to the printer on its side, which I'm actually a huge fan of. For those that did not see my Ender 3 VT review, one of my biggest gripes about the printer was with the LCD screen, but more specifically the UI running on that LCD screen. Although I did make a video showing you how to flash it with a third party firmware, the interface on the Aquila stock is much better than the V2 stock screen firmware in my opinion. The X and Y axis have built in belt tensioners and I did not get into the power supply because I wanted to leave the cable management as is, but based on a very nice write up from 3dprintbeginner.com, it appears to be a Meanwell power supply, which was actually quite surprising to me considering again the price of this printer. 
Before assembling the printer, I went ahead and took off the bottom housing so that way we could take a quick look at the main board. The board is very reminiscent of the Creality controller board in its form factor, and although I didn't have a spare one to confirm, I wouldn't be surprised if a Creality or Big Tree Tech board could be a drop-in replacement should you decide that's something you need or want to do. It is a fairly compact board and the stepper motor drivers are surface mounted. There's one blower fan to help with removing heat from the board and a slit in the aluminum in which the cables are fed through. The Aquila showed up packaged very nicely, however I did want to state that it does only come with a tiny coil of filament, which isn't all that uncommon, but if you do end up getting this printer, you'll definitely want to pick up either one or two extra spools of filament so that way you can do some printing. All the screws were neatly labeled in their own individual packages, which is something I really like to see and it helps to speed up or expedite the uh, install and assembly process. And there was a hard copy of the assembly manual as well as a PDF version on the included micro SD card. Because I've been seeing more manufacturers actually include a video on how to assemble the printer, I did check for that, but at least in my Aquila, there was no assembly video. However, the PDF guide and the printed manual guide were more than enough for me to very easily get this printer uh, up and assembled. Assembling the Aquila was basically a deja vu of me assembling the Ender 3 V2. And in that video, I mentioned that the one thing that tripped me out was the X axis belt tensioner. The uh, demonstration or the diagram in the guide that came with that printer didn't seem very obvious to me, which is why I did reference a video when assembling that. However, I was already aware of how to do it on this printer since I'd done it essentially once before, and the illustration in the Aquila PDF, in my opinion, was a little bit easier to understand. Once assembled, I powered on the printer, homed everything, and did a quick manual bed leveling before plugging in the micro SD card to see if there were any pre-sliced files. I loaded up some red PLA that I had laying around, and normally I only print out maybe one or two of the pre-sliced files on a 3D printer because they're normally sliced very, very fine layer resolution and sort of weird uh, models. But in this instance, I ended up printing out all four and I was a huge fan of the models they chose because two of the four were actually functional. One was a extruder knob that you printed out and then it would allow you to easily feed uh, or retract filament from the hot end, which I thought was cool. Another one was a tiny little tool caddy that basically slid into the aluminum extrusions and would allow you to hold the different Allen keys or clippers or spatula and stuff like that. And then another one was a simple hook as well as one that just had some basic shapes. But I did like that two of the sample parts were actually functional things that I, at least the extruder knob will end up using for sure. But I thought they did a really great job. And although I still think that they were probably sliced at a bit higher resolution than I would have done just to show off the quality that their machine can achieve, I was still very pleased with the results on all of these. All the prints turned out crisp and I was very happy with the results. I did get to test out the power loss recovery, not because I wanted to per se, but because we actually had a electrical issue here where um, something is going on with the breaker and a couple of the outlets haven't been working correctly. So I had to kill the power for an hour about halfway through this print and when I turned it back on, I got to see the power loss uh, option come up on the menu. Basically it detected it, asked if I wanted to continue. I hit yes, but as it went to home the X axis and begin printing again, it took the part right with it. So I think that it's definitely something more practical than if you accidentally flip a switch or if it's just a quick power going out or whatever happens. But if you've got a part and the bed's completely cooled down, it's gonna be pretty tough no matter what the printer is unless it's really stuck down to be able to resume. But I can at least vouch that it does indeed have power at loss recovery and it would have worked should my part or would my part not have completely come off the build plate when it tried to resume. Now that the test prints were done, I went ahead and hopped over to the computer to slice up some files and check out what kind of software they had on the micro SD card. On the SD card, they did have something called Voxeleb Slicer that I did open very briefly. I'm not sure if it's based on Cura, but really unless I'm forced to use something else, I prefer native Cura. Luckily on the SD card, they have a very simple parameters for adding the Aquila and even a profile that you can import, which is exactly what I ended up doing. Chaos Cortec has been releasing a ton of awesome models. So I hopped over to their things page to see what recent models they had released. I found an awesome Sugar Skull, which is perfect because I know someone that this will be a great gift for. I downloaded the model, imported it into Cura, and I kept most of the parameters as is. I slightly tweaked a few things and added a skirt, which is standard for all the files I print. And I loaded up a spool of this Gold Dust Proto Pasta HTPLA, which I had laying around and I figured would be perfect for this model. And I hit print. And wow, this did not disappoint. There's one section on the model that after slicing, I realized could have used the tiniest bit of supports 
but damn, the end result looks so good. Looking at it through a camera lens doesn't really do it justice, but I was beyond pleased with the results, and hopefully you could at least get the general idea of how good this print actually turned out. Next up, my buddy Chris, better known as Krusty Online, released a very practical print of a holder for boxes of nitrile gloves. Now, he does a ton of resin 3D printing and having your gloves able to be mounted to your printer or workbench is super handy and something I can definitely see me using. Although the geometries weren't the most complex, this was a very large print and even with me opting for 0.3 or 300 micron layer lines, it took over 24 hours. I printed this in Matter Hacker's Natural Build Series PLA and it turned out great. I actually didn't realize that the shell of the Phenom is magnetic, but it is. And so the uh, model that Chris created has the ability to basically drill mount it or embed magnets so that way you can slap it on something like the Phenom. And so because I don't have a ton of space here, like I complain about all the time, um, having the ability to have my gloves just up on the side of the machine is super handy and I cannot wait to actually be able to do some resin printing and use that. And I always do this, but I want to state that any of the models that I print or talk about in this video will be in the description. So if you want to print them out for yourself or check them out, you can do so as well. With the sample prints that were included on the micro SD card and these two large prints, I think we were at around 80, if not over 80 print hours. And I was really happy with the results I was getting with PLA. So for fun, I decided to throw some PETG at the printer. And I had a little bit, maybe half a spool left of some blue engine that I used for a previous project that I figured that I would throw on the machine and see how it printed. For this, I had found an Ender 3 power supply fan silencer and I decided to print it out. As far as my parameters, I bumped the bed to 70 Celsius, the hot end to 240 Celsius. I dropped the speed down from the 70 millimeters a second that I had raised it to down to 60 millimeters a second and I lowered the fan speed to 50%. Adhesion was great and the only thing I noticed was very fine hairs from stringing. I'm not gonna fault it on the printer, and since this was a very quick profile, adjusting things like retraction, speeds, temps, and cooling can really help to remove these. Next up, I found a mount for the BQH2 direct drive all metal hot end combo, and I decided to print that out. It was quite a bit more complex than the Ender 3 uh, cooling fan and required some support, so I figured we would give it a go and kind of see how the printer fared with that. Again, there was still some slight stringing, but the part, in my opinion, turned out great. The supports came off with no problem, and I was very pleased with this part. I'm actually really looking forward to testing out this H2 extruder. I've been sitting on it for a little bit and just trying to figure out what printer, what project I want to implement it into. In my review of the Ender 3 V2, I mentioned that overall my experience was great and I could definitely see it for somebody that maybe wants the Ender 3 upgraded but doesn't want to have to do all of the manual upgrades, especially doing like the board swap. But there was two things that I said I wasn't crazy about. One was that I felt the fans were quite loud and like I mentioned earlier in this video, the user interface on the LCD screen to me was an afterthought and definitely something I was disappointed with. So how does the Aquila fare in those two regards compared to the Ender 3 V2? I think that the user interface on the Aquila printer is much better than that of the stock Ender 3 V2. And the fact that they have it laying down in landscape mode versus portrait mode, I don't know, hopefully you know what that means, but the fact that they have it laying down definitely solves my one biggest issue with the Ender 3 V2 screen, which was that when you're browsing like the file explorer where you have your prints names, you couldn't see very much of the print name because of how skinny the screen was. Having the printer's uh, uh, screen rectangular gives you basically double the distance and so you can see the entirety or at least the majority of the name of your file that you're printing which was again one of my biggest gripes. As far as the fans go, I am a little bit disappointed to say that the fans are loud. I didn't do a side by side with like a decibel reader but the fans are definitely not quiet on the Aquila, which is disappointing because similar to the V2 with those silent drivers, the motion, you, you can't hear the printer actually moving around. All you can hear is the fans, which in the hot end, again, are quite noisy. Similar to the last printer I reviewed, which was this SR, the Aquila does one thing that I find a bit annoying with the LCD screen, and that is that anytime you select something, it beeps. And I can totally understand if somebody wants that feedback and likes that feature. I personally don't. I just think that it's noisy. I do a lot of printing late at night and because I am in such a central location in this tiny place that beeping can get very, very annoying. And I don't mind that it's there. I just think that if you have a beeping system in your uh, UI or in your menu system, there should be a way to disable it under the menu. 
I checked everything and did not see it. I uh, believe that Aquila has made some upgrades to their LCD screen, and this is certainly something I'm sure that they could patch in an upgrade, but it is worth noting that it is also a small thing maybe, but still a bit of an annoyance to me. So again, the main question that people have been asking me is, is the Aquila a better value than the Ender 3 V2, given that its price point is between $80 to $100 less, and looking online, the technical specifications are nearly a one-to-one. -one. And having just tested out the Ender 3 V2 and now testing out the Aquila, I'm really blown away and at least pleased to report to all of you guys that yeah, it really is, in my opinion, a better value. You are really getting the same experience as the V2, but at a fraction of the cost. I don't know how Aquila or Voxelab was able to really do it, and especially containing things like the Meanwhile power supply, but there's nothing about this pinner that to me screams it is any in any way, shape, or form inferior to that of the Ender 3 V2. So if you've been waiting for reassurance, I'm here to tell you that, yeah, I do think that it's a solid printer. And the fact that it's in the same price range as the Ender 3, which it's clearly a step up from, is really, really impressive. I'm really curious to see long-term whether uh, Voxelab and the Aquila are able to maintain this price point or how Creality responds if they end up lowering their price point. But yeah, for right now, with the current pricing that these two different machines are going at, it is pretty crazy how much they were able to shave shave off of the price and still give you essentially the exact same printer. So that is the Voxelab Aquila. If you've got any questions about anything that I covered or maybe did not cover, let me know in the comments down below and I will do my best to answer. And if I don't have the answer to the question, I have no problem reaching out to Voxelab directly and trying to get that answer for you. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single Saturday, so there is always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, links will be down below over to my Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of my current Patreon supporters. I really appreciate each and every one of you guys allowing me to come back each and every single week, spending more time doing what I love, which is making content for each of you to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.